This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. I've been a user of Uphold since 2017. They're one of my go-to exchanges. You can buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrencies on Uphold. You can also trade precious metals and equities. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. As with all exchanges, you can buy and sell on them, but I highly recommend you custody your own crypto, not your keys, not your coins. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. Hester, great to have you back on the show. Tony, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. You know that I have to start out with your your audience's favorite disclaimer, which is that my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. Yeah, Hester, you know, it's been a while since we uh, spoke. Uh, boy, have things escalated in the crypto industry. Um, you know, last year was a rough year, but yet from a macro perspective, the technology continues to grow globally. Um, I know we're going to talk about specifically US regulations. Um, and I, I would love to start with are there any updates in the dynamic of you and the other commissioners? Um, I, you know, I'm a big advocate of you, and 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 I'm thankful for you. And you have common sense, uh, you know, guidelines, rules, regulations, thoughts on how to regulate the market. Is there anyone else that's with you, you know, in your thoughts and and ideas? Well, I, as you mentioned, 2022 was a was a pretty difficult year, and I think. Um, it was a little bit unfortunate in terms of timing because Washington, there was more and more knowledge building about crypto, more and more interest building about crypto in Washington. And then with the events of 2022, a lot of, a lot of uh, sentiment has turned rather negative. That said, I, I think that there's still um, real interest when I talk to my colleagues at the commission there's real interest in trying to learn more about crypto and trying to think more about it. So I still remain somewhat optimistic. It kind of depends on what day you, you catch me on. Um, I do think it will be a critical year this, this year. I mean, we're already pretty far into it, but I think it's going to be a critical year in determining whether we you know get on a more productive path than the one we've been on or whether we stay on this, what I would describe as rather unproductive path. Mm. You know, recently I interviewed uh, one of the co-founders at Tether and we had a conversation about disruption in technology and, you know, something he said, which really stuck with me was, you know, in the internet, there was disruption, but no one really cared that much if you lost your email or certain data was hacked because it didn't really affect uh, the the system, so to speak, or the government but now this time around currency and money and the movement of value is being disrupted. And it seems uh, this is a hard one for every, for certain folks to swap pill for certain folks as well, like maybe in the government. And it seems there is a lot of pushback. Um, do you feel the same way that, you know, this is so, so disruptive it's challenging, it's moving fast and people are having a hard time grasping. Well, that may be part of it. I mean, I will say, though, that even with all the disruption that's happened within the crypto world, very little has spilled out outside of that world. And so, um, you know, there it's important for regulators to think about financial stability, of course. Um, but I'm not sure that we we can, you know, it seems to me that it was pretty contained and I think one of the other things that's changed since that time, um, when we allowed the internet, for example, to flourish, you know, allowed experimentation, is that we've gotten a bit more cautious as a people, and a bit more, a, a bit less willing to allow people to experiment and take risks. And so, even though some of these attempts within the crypto space are are really quite you know, quite limited uh, attempts to try to experiment, there seems to be an unwillingness to allow that kind of experimentation. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. I think that's something that we as a society need to rethink because a lot of the great successes of our society have been built on prior failures and we, we really can't afford to cut off the ability of people to try things. Now, of course, I mean, I think all, all of us, 
also want to make sure that people take risks carefully and think about the risks before they they take them. And, and, and there are a lot of really terrible stories from 2022 of where people really got hurt. And, and I'm not advocating um, that we not care about that, but I think there's, there's a balance to be achieved. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, some of that last year, like FTX was old fashioned fraud, like Bernie Madoff. Right. And I, I feel like, you know, it wasn't, crypto specific the, the respective blockchains were still running un, di, undisrupted you know even though ftx and celsius and all this nonsense um that's, so I think, I, yeah. that's a really important point and i think it gets too easily glossed over in washington sometimes which is that there's one question of how do you regulate centralized entities that look a lot like the traditional financial centralized entities I think a lot of people, especially post-2022, say, you know what, we want to have some sort of regulatory framework that looks a lot more similar to what we see in traditional finance. But then there's a separate question of how do you regulate things that are that are unique to this space? How do you regulate blockchain technology? How do you regulate um, certain uh, tokens, for example? Those are, I think, different questions and they're harder. Certainly, how do you regulate decentralized finance? or decentralized technologies in general, those are more difficult questions. Mm. A tough question for you, Hester. Um, is a bit of the pushback, even from maybe folks at the SEC, a bit of, hey, the system was running at a certain status quo for years with banks and the Fed and whatever it may be. And once again, it goes back to me, my question earlier, of this disruption is coming so fast. Um, it threatens the status quo. You think it's a bit of that? Because we also see in Congress, there's, I don't want to be an ageist or whatever, but maybe the older demographic, they don't get it. And they're like, this this looks weird. This looks bad. But they haven't really you know, gone into the nitty gritty and understand the technology and what's happening. Is there a bit of that, you know, that once again, I push back because of the disruption? I mean, it's certainly a fair question to ask. And I think anytime you set up a regulated system, there can be real forces to uh, stick with the status quo because you have entities that are regulated in the status quo and they're used to that regulation. And you have regulators that are comfortable regulating the entities and services and products they know. And so when something new comes in, um, it can be challenging for that system to open up and say, yes, we, we want to allow this new thing to happen. And that's why it's very important to constantly be checking to see whether uh, regulators are handling new products and new services in a way that's designed, yes, to provide the protections that the regulators are charged with providing, but also to make sure that um, that consumers, investors can get access to these new products and services. And I don't think we have that mastered in the United, I don't think we figured out how to do that in the United States, because um, if, you know, we do have pretty well established regulatory systems. And so it, it sometimes regulators will take a step back and say, how am I doing on innovation? And this is one of those opportunities, let's turn it into an opportunity to say, how am I doing on innovation? And so I, I think we we still have uh, we still have that opportunity. We still haven't taken advantage of that, and we still haven't asked those questions. Um, a question, which maybe is on the philosophical side, uh, you know, when I look at it from a macro perspective, you look throughout history of disruptive technology, whether it be electricity and the light bulb, and disrupting candle makers, and and the horse and buggy folks getting disrupted by the automobile, and so on and so forth. It does take time for technology to catch on and um, for folks to get on board. Um, is Are we in a similar situation here where there is fight, there's pushback? We don't like this. It, it, you know, change is hard. Humans don't like change, <laughs> right? But eventually, you're not going to stop this technology because innovation um, and all these things win over time. So I guess my question is, you know, do you see something similar playing out here? And 
maybe what's the timeline for something like that? And these are hard questions, I know. They're... No, but it, I mean, it's good you're thinking about things in these in, in, in these kind of philosophical terms, because I think that is important to, to think about. The problem is that regulators can actually get it wrong in a way that then does affect how innovation or where innovation happens. Um, and that is something that I'm, I'm tremendously concerned about. I mean, look, we, I don't think either, either of us knows where crypto, blockchain, and related technologies, where they'll take us, where the biggest changes in our lives will be as a result of them. Some people who look at it say, no, nah, there's nothing new here. Other people say, no, this is going to revolutionize the way we do everything. And so let's see how that plays out. The problem is if you get a regulator or a set of regulators in place who say, no, we don't want to even watch to see how that will play out, you, you can really have a substantively deleterious effect on innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know something I've been noticing with the challenges we've had here in the United States, things are moving really fast overseas in Dubai and, and other countries in the Asian markets and so forth. They're embracing the technology. There's a lot of more, a lot more clarity. I, I wouldn't say it's fully there, but um, it, there seems to be an embrace. Um, and there, there's government funds for Metaverse and whatever it is, Web three. And I'm like, where's the United States? Where where's our leadership? You know, and 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 part of that is the regulators. And but also, I feel there's been like this theme of the Operation Choke Point 2.0 and it's other uh, government agencies as well. I'm like, what's going on here in the United States? Well, I don't think government funding is the answer. I mean, I, I you know, I'm a, a pretty big believer that this, as long as the government, you know, says, okay, we're going to set up a reasonable regulatory framework within which this can happen, the private funds will come in if there's something worth funding. And private markets are really good at figuring out which projects are worth funding and which ones should be scrapped. Um, but you know, I, I think that the idea of trying to cut off crypto entirely from our existing system um, is really unwise. And it, it does force activity either outside of the U.S. And if you say that, you know, you want to make sure that U.S. people have protection of U.S. laws and regulations, that may not be something you want to do. Why would you want to drive it, drive it outside of the U.S.? Um, and you know it may require it may end up with with people using entities that they wouldn't otherwise use because those entities are the only ones that are willing to operate in an unregulated um, world or not unregulated but a, a world of ambiguous regulation. Right, that's the problem. I, I think most of the people I talk to who are thinking of moving offshore have already moved offshore. They say, you know what? I want to build here in the U.S. If you just told me what the rules were, I would be willing to build here. But I can't build here with this idea that four or five, six years from now, you might come back to me and say you didn't comply with the rules. Right. So that's that's the problem. Mm. And what I've heard and, and certain people say, and obviously I can't disclose who and, and so forth, but it's so easy to move tokens um, to someone outside, uh, an entity outside the United States, and even to maybe your family members and say, okay, I don't have staking here in the United States. I'm just going to send my token to my family and whatever, in, in whatever country they stake and they shared some of the rewards with me. So it's like, and, and that's, that's just one example, but it's, it's like, you're not gonna I I don't see a world where you're gonna stop it. It's kind of like the music industry trying to stop file sharing and these things, right? Um back in the day. This disruption's happening. You have to adapt to it. Well, yeah. And I and I again I think that if you were to establish you, meaning we and other regulators, were to establish reasonable regulatory requirements and and then help people actually figure out, okay, how do you comply with these? I think you'd have people building stuff here and people would would probably want to do stuff here, whether it's someone building something or someone using a product and service. They might look for a product and service that's based in the U.S. because 
they have a little more confidence um, around that. So again, I think that's the message I'm trying to get to my regulatory colleagues. It's not that people are, are trying to live in a world where, they're, where, they're, where there's no uh, regulatory compliance. They just need to know which, what the rules are. For sure. Um, so on that note, you know, are you working with any members of Congress um, on, you know, trying to get regulations or uh, maybe it's different bills and legislation? Well, I talk to everyone I can about um, trying to get some regulatory clarity in this area. And, um, you know, that includes any any member of Congress or their staff who are willing, willing to engage with me on it. I do think that a lot of the, um, you know, given where we are um, with a, a pretty enforcement um, centric approach here at the SEC, and, and other regulators also trying to plant their flag, often also through enforcement actions. Um, having congressional input at this point would be quite helpful. I mean, I can't tell Congress what to do, but I can tell them that I do think there's some gaps where it would be helpful. Um, so stable coin legislation, uh, legislation kind of clarifying, do if we want trading venues to be regulated for crypto, which agency should be doing that? Should it be a combination of two agencies? Um, if you do want to have some sort of registration process for things like staking or or token issuances, um, what kind of information do you think uh, should be in there? Now, Congress doesn't have to decide that, but they could say to us, hey, SEC, go create a bespoke regime for crypto trading platforms, for staking, for token issuance, for lending. Um, and, and maybe they say we want banking regulators to handle sta stable coins or maybe the SEC. But to have Congress provide some of those um, initial pieces of guidance certainly could fill some gaps. Um, and a tough question for you here. Uh, so I've spoken to Representative Heisinga, as well as Tom Emmer, um, a few other folks, Byron Donalds as well. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of letters you know, send out to the SEC and Chair Genser. Um, I, I spoke to Representative Heisinga, and th they've mentioned they're not happy with how things have been going at the SEC and so forth. And um, as far as accountability, you know, they said they they can control the purse strings a bit. Um, you know, are are you personally concerned that look things have not been going well? Uh, the SEC may lose some power or lose access to funds in in order to properly regulate the market, not talking about enforcement, but stopping the bad actors, right? There are bad actors, but we want to make sure innovation is flourishing. But, you know, are, are there any concerns there? Well, I mean, I certainly have concerns about how, how things have been going and, and uh, can understand why you're hearing some concerns from Congress. Um, I mean, ultimately, my goal is not to, to expand the SEC's jurisdiction, it's to think about what problems are we trying to solve and figure out, is the SEC the right regulator to solve those problems? So crypto trading platforms, um, if we decide that there needs to be a federal regulator, and again, I mean, that's a decision that Congress has to make. If they decide that, um, I can make an argument that the SEC would be a good regulator. Um, I can I can certainly defend the SEC uh, as being the the regulator for that, given the experience that we have. Um, might Congress decide to take that authority or to give that authority to someone else, like the CFTC? Sure, and I think that is a consequence. I mean, if we see authority being given to another agency that may not be as natural a fit for the job, uh, that could well be a result of the approach we've taken so far, which is which which has has not been particularly constructive in my in my mind. Um, so I think that's what happens. I mean, you have to establish yourself as a regulator that is willing to, um, you know, take this job on responsibly. I do think we could still do it. I still think we can make that case to Congress, but Congress may come out in a different place. Mm -hmm. For sure. And hopefully, you know, this is a year that um, we can get all this right. Uh, it's it's just so frustrating. That's an ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> um, so have you and uh, Chair Genser spoken any, uh, further about your safe harbor proposal? 
I mean, going back to to my initial thoughts, you make I mean, you put out logical, reasonable <laughs> uh, uh, recommendations, but it seems like the folks at the, the other folks at the SEC are not biting. Um, I don't know for what reason. You know, have you guys talked about you know your safe harbor proposal? You know, are they trying to add to it or remove to from it? What, what's the dynamic there? Well, look, I mean, rather than talking about the the individual conversations I've had, I think one thing to tell people is things move very slowly in Washington. And so sometimes you can, an idea can be put out there and it takes years before someone grabs that idea and says, hey, why don't we take this safe harbor idea and craft a uh, registration scheme for token offerings that is really fit for purpose, that really gives people who are buying those tokens, the information they would want to have when they're buying that token, which is what the safe harbor tried to do. Now, I think if if um, people here at the SEC were to take a look at that, there might be areas where they'd say, yeah, let's tweak this, let's add this disclosure requirement here. Um, so I, I'm still hopeful that it can, it can form the base for a tailor-made disclosure framework. And again, People will push back on that because they'll say, well, the SEC has these securities laws that have worked so well for all these years. What do you need to do? Um, you know, why are you trying to fiddle around with them and, and, and create bespoke disclosure regimes? But I think the point is that Congress also gave us the ability to create exempt, exemptions, for example, to create tailored disclosure regimes. We've done it in the past, and there's no reason that we shouldn't do it here. And so that's what I'm holding out hope that the the safe harbor, which you know, my colleagues certainly know about, that they'll be able to to think about building on that um, to create a good disclosure regime. Hmm. Um. Now, I, I want to preface this question, um, because we're going to talk a bit about some stable coins and staking and so forth. Are there you know projects in the crypto industry that are security? Sure, and, and you know and you and the folks at the SEC often talk about facts and circumstances. Um, and, and you have to examine each of those projects to see where they're at. And, and you know, it's in the line with your safe harbor. But it seems like uh, Chair Genser and, 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 and the other folks at the SEC are trying to bring everything under the security umbrella, such as stable coins. And I don't know if you can explain to me, how is a stable coin a security? And maybe it goes back to what you told me maybe a year and a half ago. It's not the asset, it's not the orange or the orange grove, but it's the packaging, the contract behind it. So I, I can you tell us, take us a bit into that? And this just relates to the Paxos BUSD situation. How is a stable coin a security? Well, I mean, I can't talk about anything, any of those press reports that have been out, but what I can say is that, you know, different people take different views on stable coins. One of the interesting things about stable coins is that that actually is, is, a topic that got quite a bit of congressional attention because it was a discrete topic. It was one that um, Congress could take and look at and think about what what are we trying to achieve with a regulatory regime here? Well, you know, if someone says I have um, assets and they're backed by by you know X Y Z, then you want to make sure that they're actually backed by that, um, for example, and so. Congress was pretty far along on developing a framework, and um, the SEC might not have been the regulator in, in some of those frameworks. And so from my perspective, we really need to defer to um, what Congress is trying to do. And, and again, as you mentioned at the outset, facts and circumstances always matter, and you can have one person calling something a stable coin and another person calling something totally different a stable coin. And, we always have to look at the facts and circumstances, but I do. Um, I, I said you were being ambitious and thinking we could get this all resolved this year, but you know, stablecoin legislation, for example, is something that that perhaps um, could get done in the near future, and, and I think that would be helpful to for Congress to decide who they wanted to regulate this area. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I know stablecoins. You know, outside of the SEC, it, 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 I understand the Fed is concerned about it, Treasury, everybody, because uh, you want to make sure that the reserves are there. And it seems everybody and their mom can launch a stable coin now because um, the technology is here to do that. But um, I understand the regulations need to be there. But the security part is 
is what I'm trying to figure out. I, I understand if they packaged it a certain way and said, hey, expectation of profit, whatever it may be, and all you know, things that align with the Howey test, but by itself, at its core, if I create a stable coin today, how is that a security unless I'm packaging it? Uh, maybe I'm off base, but I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, I think one thing that you're getting at with your question is that you have to make sure that whatever regulatory regime you put in place for stable coins allows stable coins to be stable coins and to to serve the the function that they serve now in the in the crypto world. Um, and and I think that's important not only for people who use stable coins now, but as we think about um, the 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 dollar equivalent to some of the CBDCs that other countries are rolling out. You know, we can do on in the private sector what some other countries are doing in the public sector. And that's a little beyond my remit as a as a commissioner. But I think that that is one of the what you're putting your finger on is is that that's one of the things we really need to think about. It doesn't help to put a regulatory framework in place that that doesn't make sense. So let's figure out what makes sense here. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about staking, because obviously there was a settlement with Kraken Exchange. Um, can you tell us? I don't know how much you can tell us about that, but you know, is it a similar dynamic? W were they offering a certain package that was considered security, or are you say, or is the SEC saying staking as it is? If if I'm using a self-hosted wallet and I'm participating on the Ethereum network and I'm uh, staking, that's a security. Uh, that one is also, <laughs> I'm frustrated by. <laughs> so I, there's a distinction. Why One thing is staking and one thing is staking as a service. And you could, again, facts and circumstances really matter. And even if you're just looking at staking as a service, the facts and circumstances matter. And so something could be constructed in the way that it, it could be uh, a securities offering when you're offering staking as a service. Um, but it depends on on how that's set up, and those those things really, uh, the details really do matter. Um, as you know, I put out a a dissent in the Kraken um, in the Kraken on the Kraken settlement. It, one of the things is, look, if if we decide that when you hand your crypto assets over to someone else to to stake them for you, if we decide that we want to have again, some disclosure around that. And and Congress says, you know what, um, I think that should be an SEC regulatory regime. That's fine, but you've got to figure out a way that people can actually come in and register that, that service. And um, what kinds of information would people want about a staking service? That's something that you would want to think about as you develop that kind of registration regime. And so I just think there are better ways to go about this, um, which is to take a step back, say, all right, let's put ourselves in the shoes of someone who's handing her crypto assets over to someone else to stake for what information would she want? Is the SEC the right regulator to do this? If so, let's sit down and, and, and develop a, a registration regime. And then let's, let's, show that people can actually get through that registration regime and register things. Instead, our answer, I mean, in, in the Kraken settlement uh, and other, in other instances, are, are, as we talked about earlier, our answer has been, well, just don't do it in the U.S. And I mean, that doesn't make sense either, right? Yeah, and it goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, once again, I'm hearing rumblings. People are like, yeah, you, you want to bet it in the United States? I'll just send it to people overseas. They'll stake for me in a pool there. And so what did you do? Like you're just moving the, the service and whatever it is offshore. It just doesn't make sense. Um it doesn't make sense to me to 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 do that either. Again, when we could sit down and and that was why my language in that statement was a little bit strong, but I think as an institution, not individual staff, individual staff at the SEC uh, is not what I'm referring to, but as an institution, we've been a bit lazy, right? Because it is hard work to sit down and say, let's figure out what problem we're trying to solve with our disclosure regime. Let's figure out what the right disclosure regime is. Let's talk to other people to make sure that they all agree that this is what we're trying to achieve and, and then do this thing um, in a way that 
then we can actually see registered products and services at the end of the day. Mm. Now, after the settlement news came out, uh, Jesse Powell um, of Kraken, he kind of tweeted out something that contradicted Chair Genser about, you know, saying all I had to do was come on the website and fill out a form. And I know Chair Genser has said these things on TV and uh, but folks in the industry are saying it's not that easy. That, that, that's It's not very clear on registering and coming in and filling out whatever form. So I don't know if you can speak to this, but what's going on here? There seems to be confusion. It is one side saying one thing and the other side saying one another thing. No, this has been a source of great frustration for me. I mean, obviously, uh, when you're registering a securities offering, it's it's, you know, it's not the same as, as signing up for a class online or something like that. You know, there's, there's information that you have to provide, but we should have a process for thinking about what it actually would look like if someone were trying to register one of these products or services. And um, we shouldn't undersell or we shouldn't underestimate the, the effort that would go into that. And and it does really require an, a regulator who is willing to work with the industry and with people who would use these products and services um, to figure out a productive path forward. It's it's not just pressing a button or, or you know filling out a form on the website. There there it it's a little bit more involved than that. Mm. As we can see, because we don't see people getting through the process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's frustrating. Um, and, uh, you know, as someone uh, who's seeing both sides, I, I've spoken to builders and innovators and entrepreneurs and also on the investing side, I'm a, I'm a token holder, I'm staking, I'm doing different things. It's just so frustrating. And uh, um, people want me to ask you, how do we make you the chair of the SEC? That's it's this is not about personalities. This is about an institutional problem that we really need to solve. Mm. And so there's a very clear path forward, right? It's too bad we didn't start the path forward a couple of years ago, but we could still do it. So what what do we do? We, the SEC, could put out a document, a discussion document to say, you know, take each of these areas separately, right? What are we going to do on token securities offer, uh, token offerings? What are we going to do on staking? What are we going to do on crypto lending, NFTs, whatever, whatever you want to look at? Say, here are some parameters that we're thinking when we look at this, we're, we're seeing these things are sort of signals that something might be a securities offering and therefore would require registration. And here's what we're thinking in terms of what a registration regime would look like, what kind of information we're trying to get out. Okay, so you put that out and you invite people in to have a public roundtable. And I know that that doesn't sound like much, much, but I think it's it's important to have these conversations out in the open rather than having them be conversations between us, the regulator, and one entity. You want to make sure that not only the entities offering these products and services or tokens, but also people who would be buying those products and services or tokens, have that conversation. Perhaps we could do that jointly with the CFTC. I think that'd be even better. Mm. Um, and then from that, we can either develop a rule or an exemptive order, which would then allow people to come in, actually come in and register because some of those fundamental issues would then be resolved. You wouldn't have to resolve them every time someone comes in. Then our staff, our disclosure staff, could do what it always does, which is work to make sure that the unique aspects of each offering or each, you know, each product, that those unique aspects are, are, are coming through in the disclosures. Um, and that's what we could do. And even if Congress ended up deciding they wanted to, to legislate, they could draw on all that work we did and use that in writing their legislation. That's what we need to be doing. That doesn't require, I mean, we could start doing that tomorrow if we wanted to. So um, let's, let's just work on, uh, from my perspective, that's what I want the agency to be working on. Let's just work on doing something productive. Mm. 
for sure. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the library situation. I don't know how much you can speak to it, but um, certainly a significant uh, ruling there. Um, and and any thoughts on the outcome of, of that? It's an ongoing litigation, so I can't talk about it. I know that won't make your listeners happy to hear, but I can't talk about ongoing. Um, no problem. You know, as things wrap up there, we'll have you back on to talk about it, you know, once it's uh, all wrapped up. Um, there was a question from the community that came came uh, to me, and uh, it's relating to internal ethics rules at the SEC, how they apply to employees trading cryptos. If you, another commissioner or the SEC staff attorney bought, let's say, Ethereum, does this have to be reported? Are there some cryptos that require reporting and others that do not? So there are government-wide government rules. I mean, I think if you wanted the SEC specific rules, you could probably ask ask someone else at the SEC. I mean, you'd have to make a formal request for those, I guess. Um, but there are, there are government-wide rules and that includes uh, reporting requirements. And I think um, that those reporting requirements probably would apply to uh, to a lot of crypto assets uh, as well. So, um, and that that applies to commissioners like me. We have to disclose all kinds of things, and and similarly with staff. Gotcha. Um, what's on your priority list for twenty twenty three as it relates to crypto? Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I go back to what I just said. You know, let's get this productive process moving forward. Um, I think there certainly are lots of areas where uh, there are outright frauds where we where we have enforcement work to do. Um, but then let's get the the process moving for for people who are trying to figure out how to comply with with the rules. And um, let's let people concentrate on building things instead of trying to discern the regulatory regime by uh, you know reading the tea leaves. Do you feel uh, the U.S. is in danger of losing out here on the on Web three crypto blockchain? Um, that maybe it might be too late on uh, when we figure it out that a lot of jobs and and the economic benefits are overseas by the time we get it right. I mean, what I worry most about is I worry about losing talented uh, people um, to other places. And I think the U.S. has always been somewhere people want to come and they want to they want to build things because there are people from all over the world coming here to do the same thing. And it's it's an exciting environment. So I do worry about that. I mean, I think if we got our act together and we and we tried to put something together in a in a, um, you know, in a reasonably fast manner, we could um, we could get people even to come back here and we could we could change the, the dynamic. Um, it's important, whatever we do, that we don't try to prescribe too much because we could end up then in a situation where uh, we we think we know what's coming, but we're not actually right about what's coming. And we write the regulatory regime with an idea of what the future is going to be. And it's not actually that. Um, that could be problematic. So putting in a reasonable principles-based framework that achieves the, the objectives we're trying to achieve here is, is what I think we should do and could do. And if we did that, I think we would see innovation happening here in the U.S. I don't think it's too late. Hmm. I, I guess maybe because I'm, I'm in it every day, I, I feel like we, you know, we're, we're in, in that situation, but maybe I need to step, step back a bit too. And, Okay, well, you know, people are remarkably um, uh, forgiving, I think, sometimes because the United States is such a dynamic place, but we can't take that for granted either. And I think we're seeing, you know, for example, Europe just is putting in this Mika framework, which is pretty comprehensive. And, you know, it may turn out that there are aspects of it that don't work as anticipated or don't work um, as smoothly as, as maybe had been hoped, but the fact that they set out to actually put a framework in place, I think, is really instructive for us that it can be done. Um, they've been working on it for for some time now, but but we can learn also from what our international counterparts have done. So 
I, I hope that that I'm right that it's not too late. Um, I, I think that we still we still could do it if we took advantage of the opportunity that's before us. Now, in the United States, um, lobbying is a big part of how things get done in D.C. and in government. Uh, last year, we saw, despite you know the, the problems we saw last year with FTX and so forth, BlackRock made big entry into the market, big partnerships, Bitcoin Spot Trust, BNY Mellon launched crypto custody, and, and some other big names, NASDAQ and so forth. Do you feel that those big players, because of their legacy influence on government and the law, the lobby machine, right? Um, maybe they can get certain things pushed through and put the pressure on Congress. Uh, uh, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I think having people who know, um, you know, who know the rules uh, as written is, is all having them in the conversation is, is helpful. But I think one thing that we're seeing now, which is, which has been, troubling me is that um, you have regulatory messages going out sort of suggesting that uh, traditional regulated entities shouldn't have anything to do with crypto. And sometimes it's something like our staff accounting bulletin 121, which made it really costly for public companies um, and, and any other entity that is, is going to be held to SAP 121 made it really costly for them to custody. Uh, so we, I think, need to be really careful about how we write our rules because you could end up pushing all of those people out of the space. Now, some people within the crypto world might be very happy to have traditional players outside of the, you know, to have them pushed out. But I think a healthier dynamic is, is to kind of let the market develop the way the market would develop. Um, and not have regulators put their put their um, you know push push things out of the regulatory frame frame altogether. So um, you know we'll see. I think as as more people get interested in this technology, you'll see more voices um, showing up to to advocate for um, allowing experimentation. Um, but I think it's important to remember that everyone's voice matters uh, you know you you all have representatives in washington and we the regulators believe it or not we really do work for the american people so you can come talk to us too for sure and hester you know you just mentioned custody and i was i completely forgot to ask you about the custody it's rules it's that cool. yeah. um, so, so we just put out a rule on custody and actually this rule is not about crypto it has a crypto angle but it's it's primarily just about how investment advisors safeguard the assets of their clients. And so typically what an investment advisor will do is is um, rely on a qualified custodian to hold the assets. Um, so, you know, the, the, the idea is you want to make sure that your advisor isn't running off with your assets. Now, figuring out how the qualified custodian works in the crypto context is uh, difficult. The changes that are being made for investment advisors and for custodians generally, they're very, they're very far reaching changes. Um, and so they'll, they'll affect all custody arrangements if they, if they go final. But I do have questions and I hope that people who are involved in crypto take a look at the rule just to see how it will affect crypto custody specifically. One concern I have is that it could make it it could shrink the pool of potential qualified custodians. Um, there's some good aspects to what is being done in that rule, but there are other aspects that just give me real concern that what we're trying to do here too is just say to investment advisors, it's better if you have nothing to do, if you uh, just don't even get involved with your, your clients' uh, crypto activities and don't provide them advice in that area at all. And that doesn't seem like a good outcome. Again, the comment period is open right now, and so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be very interested to see what people have to say. Yeah, uh, to your point, I, I see some good in there, um, things that make sense, uh, but yet still some things that need to be ironed out. And I I spoke to uh, Standard Custody CEO Jack McDonald recently. I think he had some positive thoughts on it. I, I'll be speaking to. Mike Belshi, a BitGo, a crypto custodian as well. I'm going to get his thoughts. So 
to everyone listening, this is just proposed and it's in your comment period and we'll see where it goes from there, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a big it's a big rule change. It's a short comment period, typical uh, of late. So if you have thoughts on it, um, you know, take note of the short comment period. Hmm. All right, Hester, before I let you go, you know, what can folks do to support you and, um, you know, in any way in, in, in your proposals for crypto and so forth? Yeah, I mean, I think rather than supporting me, I hope people just support whatever they think is a, is a rational approach to regulating crypto. Um, and, and that I think a big part of that is actually getting news out there about what the use cases are, because that really speaks to people in Washington. And why does that matter? It matters because if, if people in Washington realize that there are use cases, then it, it pushes crypto higher up on the priority, um, on the agenda of, of things that need to get done. And so that can be helpful. And then also, you know, I just encourage people when you do see fraud, we have a whistleblower uh, a whistleblower program here at the SEC. There's, there is a form on the website, <laughs> on the website for this that you can go and fill out a form if you have a whistleblower tip complaint or referral, and um, and and that gets the information in our system so that we can spend our enforcement resources going after the bad actors. Hester, I lied. Uh, one more question I'm going to ask you before you go. Uh, it, it, it's on CBDCs. I don't think I've ever asked your thoughts on CBDCs. I believe in the digital world, we're headed to the token economy, tokenization, all that. CBDCs will be beneficial. But you know, a lot of people are concerned about privacy and, and the co- alignment to the Constitution, right to privacy and so forth. What are your thoughts on CBDCs? Well, again, I mean, it's a little bit outside of my purview as a as an SEC commissioner. What I will say is there's a lot of, um, you know, the United States has private alternatives to a CBDC. Um, and I think there's value in having competition in that space, uh, which, which stable coins can provide. I know there are a lot of people who are enthusiastic about the idea of a CBDC or see it as as absolutely necessary. But I think that the crucial element is the one you mentioned, which is privacy and 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 the the ability for people to spend their money as they want. And so anything that would allow the government to turn off your ability to spend money as you see fit is is quite is quite troubling. And I think um, the technology can be programmed in a way to make that harder to do, but that's certainly something that in any conversation about this topic, and I mean, it's something I feel passionate about more more broadly, not just with respect to a CBDC, but the importance of preserving people's ability to engage, to, to live their financial lives without um, without being watched um, mm-hmm. by the government. You know, it's one thing if if the government has reason to suspect that you're engaged in illegal activity. Um, but it's another, if you're just a regular person going about your life, um, I don't think that we should we should live in a society where the government is watching everything you do. And I have problems with some of the surveillance mechanisms that we put in place in the sphere that I do regulate. And, and I, I would hate to see um, that kind of surveillance be extended outside of that sphere. Mm. Hester, always a pleasure. Thank you. Great Uh, to talk to you, Tony.